Now, we've spent, what, I don't know, over 12 uh, PowerPoints talking about antibacterials. But of course, bacteria are not the only infectious organisms we treat. So uh, this lecture is obviously on antifungals, okay? And <clears throat> I divide this into the three main types of fungi we deal with. Dermatophytes, which of course are ringworm, yeast infections, and the systemic mycoses, okay? So we'll start with dermatophytes. Ringworm, you can either treat topically or systemically. There are a slew of topicals that you can use. Uh, <clears throat> the ones here in gray are human products typically not used topically in veterinary medicine. These are the more common ones uh, that we use. Okay, the point being there are a lot of them out there that uh, you have the option of using. Okay, the first one, lime sulfur, uh, is an old, old treatment, but it's still there because it's a very, very good treatment. It is literally lime and sulfur uh, applied to uh, either as a uh, dip or a pour on. Most people now, practitioners, don't have the capability to do a true dip where you lower them into uh, a vat of solution. Uh, and now in cattle, those still exist, running through um, basically pools where they jump in and are submerged. Uh, <coughs> uh, but mostly veterinarians use porons. So they'll shampoo the animal and while it's still wet, they'll uh, um, pour on one of these. Now, the <coughs> it's very good against ringworm, but it also treats sarcoptes. All right, so you get two things out, out of one uh, preparation. <coughs> the, the really good thing about this is its safety. It is extremely safe. You can use it in just about any age, puppy and kitten. Your only issue is uh, making sure it doesn't get into the eyes where it will irritate them. But it's extremely well tolerated. Okay, and very effective. When they compared, they took infected hairs from animals that had ringworm, and the hairs have little endospores as infected particles on them, and they would soak them in these different uh, antifungal solutions and then uh, bring them out at timed intervals and culture them to see if they were sterilized. And lime sulfur was one of the ones that had the best onset of kill and best completeness of kill. So it's a very good product in that regard. What are the drawbacks? Well, it stinks. Uh, <coughs> uh, it's got lime in it. Uh, it's got sulfur in it. The sulfur particularly, rotten egg odor, burnt sulfur odor. Uh, so that's kind of objectionable from inside your clinic. Um, when I was in community practice, these, we would do these and invariably the whole hallway outside our area would smell of rotten eggs for the next hour or so. Uh, I lobbied unsuccessfully for 10 years to get the dean to put a vent fan in our bathroom, uh, the bathing room, <laughs> to, uh, um, <coughs> to handle this. I'm convinced if I could ever have gotten him down there while we were doing a lime sulfur dip, he would have done it, but I never could get him down there, so uh, we still struggled through. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is it will, uh, the animal will stain furniture or rugs, particularly uh, white, white colored ones, and especially while they're still wet or damp. So never send one of these pets home uh, damp or they certainly will stain uh, the furniture. And even dry for the first day or so, it's probably a good idea for the owner to uh, have towels on wherever they lie, this sort of thing. But old product, but a very good product, especially safe if you, if you need to do puppies or kittens. Now, uh, the azoles we'll talk about uh, for systemic as well, but they're out there topically. Uh, I'll go through most of these. The uh, first ones are too toxic to use systemically, so they are limited to uh, topical administration. Uh, I used a lot of myconazole, but ketoconazole, usually as shampoos, 
these are out there. Uh, they're well tolerated and they do work well. Those are probably the main two topicals. Now, uh, the next three tend to be uh, <coughs> more veterinary specific, less human use. Uh, well, for that matter, lime sulfur is not human use either. Uh, TBZ, thibendazole, is actually an uh, old dewormer, anthelminic in the benzimidol class, like Panicure, which is fenbendazole but it happens to also be active against dermatophytes. Okay, uh, in the old days it was not uncommon for farmers to take TBZ paste and uh, rub it into ringworm lesions on uh, their calves and this sort of thing. You almost can't find TBZ paste. Now why do I mention it? It's because there's one product you're going to use uh, uh, out there that has it in it. If you run into Trezoderm as a topical in small animals, uh, Trezoderm is a solution that's got uh, neomycin, thibendazole, and dexamethasone in it, okay? It's used in ears and on skin, and the TBZ is in there for the uh, dermatophyte effects. Chlorhexidine is an antiseptic. You may know it as Nalvasan. It comes uh, primarily as shampoos. You can use it as a rinse, but shampoos are really common. Uh, also quite good. Now if you do large animal, uh, it's not uncommon for some practitioners to have the owner apply it full strength to the ringworm uh, area. Now be cautious, don't do this on small animals typically or yourself. The concentrate is pretty irritating and you can uh, uh, burn, do a chemical burn uh, with straight chlorhexidine. Uh, and even in large animals, I would be cautious and, and kind of watch uh, for tissue reaction. But uh, again, very effective. Oh, standby iodines. I'll talk about iodines when we come to antiseptics and disinfectants. Uh, <coughs> but they're, they're basically is what's called a tamed iodine, uh, which is a povidone iodine, um, not very irritating. Then you have the iodine solutions and tinctures which are not um, tamed, they're more aggressive, either are used in uh, ringworm. Primarily in uh, small animals, the tamed iodine shampoos are used. In large animals, we tend to see more of the uh, more aggressive solutions and tinctures uh, applied and in all these cases in large animals it's nice if you can take a stiff brush and brush off the crusts and that sort of thing and apply them. Uh, <coughs> large animal uh, uh, and most of these typically once a day uh, application although if you have the ability to do it and they tolerate it uh, twice a day is good. So uh, topical is nice, you don't have the systemic side effects or risks to be concerned about. Uh, <coughs> but uh, there are times when we need a systemic. Uh, one of those is when we have an uh, oncomycosis, which is basically another uh, word for a nail infection. Okay. Uh, <coughs> now, you may have seen they do have products out there in human medicine, Jubilia, and some of these that are approved for topical nail infection haven't been looked at in veterinary medicine, probably won't be. Uh, I'm suspicious they wouldn't work because the thickness of the nail in our pets is going to be so much more so than the human nail. Uh, but we usually have to rely on a systemic uh, that incorporates into the nail bed uh, to treat oncomycosis. Uh, when you have multifocal infections or where topical application is not practical, then again an, another reason uh, to use systemic. And uh, where topical application is not practical, there are a lot of things there. Uh, a lot of times these are around the eyes because it's spread by contact very commonly. So it's hard to, um, you have to be very careful not to get the topicals in the eye, and that's one reason for systemic. Uh, but more is just that you, you got, 
it's not a focal area you're treating, you're treating the whole cat or the whole dog and systemic is a little easier. One trick a lot of people do when they're using topicals on cats is if you'll make a little screen wire frame and put that in your bathtub, it gives the cat something to latch onto with its paws and it'll stay latched onto the screen wire while you bathe and, and, uh, and uh, apply the, the topicals. Okay, back to uh, systemics, common agents, these are the ones I'll talk about, okay. Kind of the, uh, the old standby that's still out there is Greasy of Fulvin. I'll talk about why it's less commonly used than it once was, it's been replaced, but it still might be used particularly in horses. Um, it's kind of unique. It disrupts the mitotic spindle. Um, it's only effective on dermatophytes, has no activity on yeast or, or other fungi. But the thing that's, that's kind of neat about it, it actually incorporates into the keratin of the skin and nail. And you recall that dermatophytes require keratin as a nutritional uh, product to grow. All right, and by incorporating the greasy fulvin in the keratin, it, it basically starves the, the dermatophyte to death. It can't use the keratin when greasy fulvin's bound to it. Okay, so uh, basically you just keep them on greasy fulvin until the infected skin or nail is shed. It's usually given uh, orally once daily uh, to small animals and horses. Now, GI side effects can occur, and if I see that occurring, then I may take that daily dose and divide it BID, uh, get a little less GI side effect, and I'll talk about food here next. Uh, now, this uh, product comes as either a micro-sized, which is the veterinary product, Fulvison, or the human ultra-micro-sized uh, product. Okay, it's kind of like improved and new and better improved uh, in advertising. Uh, <coughs> absorption uh, of the micro size is an issue. It's enhanced by fat containing meal uh, or polyethylene glycol in the formulation. Mostly this, uh, if we use the micro size, we'll sometimes add corn oil uh, to the diet uh, in horses, you can mix this into the feed and add a little corn oil into the feed if you want to. Uh, <coughs> uh, margarine can be incorporated when you dose this uh, in the animals. If you use the ultra micro size, that's not as necessary. The ultra micro size is a smaller particle, as you'd guess, so it has uh, more surface area and is better absorbed, about twice as well. So we don't have to uh, add fat to the diet so much with the ultra micro size. I pointed out because the dose is different for both. So you need to know which one you're using, not only uh, in terms of um, <coughs> whether you need to add fat to the diet, but also in terms of the dose used. And the human products typically also have peg in them to enhance their absorption anyway. All right. So oral, but make sure you, which formulation you're using and take that into account in how you dose it. You don't have to treat this a while, typically three to four weeks uh, for most skin infections, four to six months for the nail. The nail actually has to grow out and shed, uh, so you're going to be clipping the nails periodically, um, getting rid of the diseased tissue, and you need to get all of the diseased tissue out and cut away in a healthy nail before you stop uh, the antifungal. And this is not just for greasy pull, and this is for any of the, the systemics. Uh, if you stop too soon, then it's still viable in the nail and it starts to grow again. Okay. Now, what we do, instead of a, just a set time period, we usually base uh, stopping treatment on negative uh, fungal culture. Uh, dermatophyte test media, DTM, is really easy to do. 
if you don't do bacterial cultures in your clinic, every clinic ought to be able to do DTM cultures. It's really simple. You buy these pre-made uh, vials with the auger in them. You just put some of the infected hairs on the, the auger, put it in a dark room. It doesn't require an inc incubator. Just put it under the cabinet where it's dark and then come back uh, a week and see if it's grown and if the auger has changed immediate a color. Um, Dr. Austin, if he hasn't talked about it, I'm sure he will about the color change and what you look for. Uh, we're looking for at least one and preferably two negative DTMs before we stop. All right, now the, what draws this out is the microbiology lab doesn't want to report out a negative until it's negative after three weeks uh, of incubation. What I've found clinically is most of the ones that are positive are going to be positive at one week. All right, so I'll take my first culture. If it's still positive at a week, I know I've got to continue the um, greasy pulling. If it's negative at a week, I may take my second culture and let it be incubating at the same time. I don't call it negative till that three weeks, but I can kind of speed things along that way. But you want at least one, preferably two, negative DTMs before you stop uh, the culture. And this is true on the others as well. Uh, it's not used as much as it once was, and the reason are the toxicities. Uh, the most serious side effect is bone marrow suppression, and especially in cats. Cats are really prone to the bone marrow suppression. Uh, especially if they're retrovirus infected. They already uh, uh, have bone marrow suppression from this and you can uh, worsen it. I want to say Dr. Gray says Persians may be a little bit more uh, susceptible as well. Um, this is significant enough that largely I just won't use Grisio Pulvin in the cat. Um, I'd have to have a reason that they wouldn't tolerate an alternative. I will consider it in dogs um, but I will monitor their CBCs for, for uh, uh, anemia and uh, leukopenias and thrombocytopenias. Uh, that's the main reason we're getting away from using Grisio Pulvin is the side effects. Hey, still uh, about the only thing I'm aware of you could use systemically in the horse. As I said, you can see some anorexia and GI signs. Again, Dividing that up and giving it uh, with food if you weren't already um, seems to help that a good bit. Remember this is a teratogen, so never give greasy fulvin to a pregnant animal as you risk birth defects. It's also been reported in lab animal studies to cause hepatomas and thyroid adenomas and various other carcinomas. So as such, it's banned in food animals. Now it's not on the banned list. The reason is that it's just not used very much. Anecdotally, there are some reports of Grisio fulvin orally in cattle for ringworm that seem to, to work. But um, ringworm in cattle, you have to realize, is primarily a seasonal disorder, uh, mainly in young animals, in calves. And what happens is that uh, everything's fine, winter comes along, and so the farmer starts putting out hay in round bales, he starts putting out feed in troughs for the winter, so they're congregated together in their button heads and uh, bustling against each other, so it spreads really easily. So you'll see outbreaks of ringworm in cattle during the winter. Now this is normally in cattle a self-limiting condition. If you can keep them from getting reinfected, then it will often resolve on its own. So you're rocking along uh, during the winter and you treat it if it's really bad. But when spring comes and the grass comes out and you're no longer supplementing their feed where they're not congregated in groups, it tends to be, go away. All right, so that's one reason. Only in the show animal might you consider this, uh, again, because of congregation and, and infected feed troughs and this sort of thing. But the problem is, again, we really shouldn't use it in food animals uh, because it is a carcinogen. Not banned, but it falls in that category of, of not being used. And remember, 
in certain parts of the world, horses are used for food. So if you were to be fluent in French and practice in France, they eat a good bit of horse meat, I understand. All right. Uh, so because of all these and small animals, the use of Grisio fulvin is decreasing. Uh, <coughs> what we use instead, and particularly in cats, we'll use the systemic azoles. And I'll talk about all of these in the systemic mycosis section. Um, <coughs> uh, but because of the bone marrow suppression in cats particularly, we'll use an azole. And just recently, an oral itraconazole solution, itrafungal, is now approved in cats for ringworm. So we have an approved azole uh, for use in kitty cats. And again, it's the, the solution because it has uh, better, more consistent bioavailability. Now, one that gets uh, some interesting press is terbenafin, which you know is Lamisil. Lamisil is a human-only product. You know, it's, it's the little one with the little devils with pitchforks that are running around attacking your nail bed on TV. Um, that's Lamisil or terbenafin. Uh, um, in man, Lamisil concentrates in the skin and sebaceous secretions. So this is really nice, but it turns out it doesn't do it in dogs. Um, <clears throat> so uh, there's really no hard data about how effective Lamisil terbenafin is relative to, uh, say, the azoles. Um, <clears throat> It is an alternative. This is what Dr. Gunner, dermatologist, said. I asked her her opinion of it, and she said terbenafin is a choice, but not necessarily superior to or inferior to the azole. In feline ringworm, itriconazole is what she most prefers, but for dogs, I would go uh, with either ketoconazole or terbenafin. Uh, now, I'll talk ketoconazole. She's using this mainly because it's cheaper than itriconazole, uh, so it depends a little bit on the dog. Now, there are a few case reports and some in vitro work that indicates it might work in the systemic mycoses, but this is not really well established. So you hear occasionally of people adding terbenafin in with uh, a systemic mycotic antifungal, but it's really not uh, well established uh, in terms of evidence. So that's uh, terbenafin or Lamisil. Uh, I'm waiting for the work to come out to show it has an advantage. Right now, I would say the azoles would be my systemic um, <coughs> uh, antifungal for dermatophyte. Now, lufenuron, which is program, is a flea control product. And <coughs> uh, it's not used that much anymore, but when it first came out, it was kind of revolutionary. It, it interferes with chitin in the flea, or the flea uh, larva, and there's a little sharp spike evidently on the flea larva that's uh, made of chitin in large part, and that spike is what he uses to break out of the egg. Well, so when you interfere with that spike in the larva, he can't get out of the egg anymore, so it's a, a growth inhibitor. Taken orally, uh, there will was, I guess there's still an, an injection for cats. Uh, but this was really wonderful because up till then we didn't have frontline or advantage or revolution or any of the things we have now that are so good. All we had was the organophosphates and uh, pyrethrins and uh, uh, flea control was a big problem. So this, this was really kind of, kind of neat. Well, <laughs> a veterinary school in Israel started looking at uh, flea control issues there with lufenuron and somehow in processing the records they noticed that animals that were on lufenuron didn't get ringworm okay and so uh, we know now that chitin is involved in the dermatophyte metabolism as well so this there's came this push to look at is it effective in treatment and the answer is probably not so if I have an active ringworm, I probably would not rely on program. However, if you're trying to prevent it, okay, then maybe so. Now where would you prevent it? You wouldn't put your 
your average dog and cat on program just to prevent ringworm. But you've all seen, you know, your, your crazy cat lady that has 12, 15 cats, all right? And if ringworm gets out into that many cats, that's a huge deal. Uh, so perhaps there in the cattery where uh, you can use it to control fleas and uh, simultaneously uh, uh, prevent ringworm, it's, it's probably a legitimate consideration. 